Welcome to a series of recorded virtual forums entitled Healthcare Cleveland, COVID-19, 2020 and beyond. Hosted by Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, I'm Stan Gerson, Interim Dean for the school. We held these forums prior to the first presidential debate on September 29th, broadcast from our health education campus, a new state-of-the-art teaching and learning facility that the university shares with the Cleveland Clinic. One of the topics for the debates is healthcare. And through these forums, we hope to showcase Cleveland's robust medical community, the nation's leader in research and delivery, biotechnology and innovation, medical and interprofessional education, and healthcare reform. Each forum includes panelists who are experts across our faculty from our affiliated hospitals and national and community health partners. Through them, we will show how we rapidly pivoted and have been managing the COVID-19 epidemic here in Northeast Ohio, as well as other pressing issues affecting global health care today. We hope you enjoy these lively discussions, expert opinions with real-time examples, and audience participation. And we hope that they will help share your perspective on the political environment and decisions we have to make this fall. We hope you enjoyed this panel discussion and are leaving better informed about Greater Cleveland's medical community and how we are managing today's healthcare issues. And most importantly, how we are discovering medical breakthroughs, treating patients, and saving lives. Thank you for watching and keep healthy and safe. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth and last in a series of forums entitled Healthcare Cleveland, COVID-2020 and Beyond, hosted by Case Western Reserve University and its School of Medicine. Cleveland is one of the nation's leaders in healthcare, with four world-class medical centers, including Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals Cleveland, Metro Health Center, and the VA Hospital, all affiliated with Case's School of Medicine, and carrying out world-leading research today and training tomorrow's physicians and scientists. This is our opportunity to deliver our perspective to the nation prior to the debate next week. I'm so pleased that so many of you decided to join us for this event. Our panel this afternoon will be discussing why biotech advances matter more than ever. I'm your moderator, Mark Chance. I'm Vice Dean for Research at the School of Medicine, and I'm joined by a stellar panel, and I'd like to introduce them right away. First, Dr. Agata Exner, PhD, Professor of Radiology, Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and University Hospitals Cleveland. Welcome, Agata. Thank you. Happy to be here. Dr. Timothy Chan, MD, Director of the Center for Immunotherapy and Precision Immuno-Oncology in the Cleveland Clinic. Tim, welcome. Great to be here, Mark. A third, Dr. Robert Kirsch, PhD, Chairman, Department of Biomedical Engineering at Case Western Reserve University and Director of the Case Culture Translational Research Partnership. And it looks like Bob is already at his seat for the healthcare debate next week. Bob, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. And lastly, Dr. Harvey Lodish, PhD. Dr. Lodish is a founding member of the Whitehead Institute, a professor of biology and bioengineering, a founder of Genzyme and Millennium Pharmaceuticals, to name a few companies. He's also quite, per also quite pertinent to our discussion today. He's been an advocate for and leader of the Massachusetts Life Science Center, which was a 10-year, $1 billion project to create jobs and drive economic development in Massachusetts. Dr. Lodish, welcome to our forum today. Thanks for including me. The panel discussion will last about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll address questions from you, the audience, in the remaining time. Several of you have submitted questions in advance. Thanks for that. And for questions during the session, just please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you could submit a question anytime during the discussion, and we'll begin to address your questions, as I said, at around 2.45, and we'll continue until the forum ends at 3 o'clock. So welcome again to the audience. As we know, the COVID-19 crisis moved from an early identification of the responsible strain to a widespread of the virus across the world in a relatively short time, 
with widespread death and suffering. At the same time, a nearly unprecedented effort to develop diagnostics, treatments, and vaccines against COVID was catalyzed by the crisis. In Cleveland in particular, a COVID research task force was formed, and within a few weeks, over 270 faculty across the city had joined together to conduct uh, team-based research to fight the pandemic. The virus itself hampered initial efforts at stopping its spread. We all remembered the upheaval of the pandemic, shuttering our laboratories, halting or delaying uh, over a thousand industry-related clinical trials, as I understand, since March. And since then, the research and development enterprise has clawed its way back to the lab and to the clinic. Amazingly, well over 15 vaccine studies are now in clinical trials. <coughs> Excuse me. I enjoy checking out the New York Times coronavirus vaccine tracker where I can see what's happening. Uh, so far, though, with zero approved. This rapid response emphasizes the worldwide spread of biotech companies in nearly every country and the amazing ecosystem set up to move novel ideas from the lab to patients and to the market. Dr. Lodish, we know Massachusetts and Boston and Kendall Square are epicenters of this kind of activity. Can you describe your role in the Mass Life Sciences Center, focusing on evaluating and funding companies over the valley of death? Sure. Um, to begin, this was an initiative by the previous governor, Deval Patrick, uh, a $1 billion investment of state funds over 10 years under the Secretary of Economic Development. The idea was to create jobs in the biotech industry in Massachusetts. He asked me to set up an advisory board. Uh, roughly 15 people, including stellar academic scientists who've started companies, uh, many chief scientific officers, presidents of some of the largest biotech companies in Massachusetts, and importantly, venture capital partners, partners in these firms who knew how to evaluate young companies. And among our successful projects, we called it the Accelerator Program, where every year we would evaluate perhaps 30 applications from small early stage companies, companies in some cases with a handful of scientists and we would offer them $1 million, roughly, to get over a specific hurdle. This is the valley of death, uh, as it's called, uh, to be able to get serious money from venture capital and other investors. And each year, we would fund four or five of these. Uh, we know the program was successful, because if the company went on to raise $21 million, they had to pay back the loan. And roughly half the companies, probably more than that now, actually paid back the loan. So it's an example of what the state could do uh, to encourage early stage companies to take research out of our universities and research hospitals and get it into the marketplace. And it's this kind of initiative I would love to see in Cleveland where Mark didn't mention I grew up in Cleveland. I didn't mention that, and we're, uh, we're very grateful for the attention. And, no, and no, go ahead. No, and my first research uh, almost 60 years ago was done at Case Western Medical School. So I'd really love to see biotech uh, flourish in Cleveland. You have all the pieces in place in terms, as you said, the top hospitals and uh, the clinic and the medical schools. So, Dr. Lotus, I know you're starting new companies all the time. I follow your work closely. One of them, Tevard, has recently licensed technology from the School of Medicine and is developing therapies for epilepsy and other rare childhood diseases. Tell us about the novel ways to incubate these technologies and form companies in, these, in very capital-efficient ways in this new Lab Central facility. Sure. Um... To start a small company, you need a lot, you may have only a few people, but you need a lot of equipment, which is very expensive. And traditionally, 
small companies would have to rent space, spend months equipping it uh, with expensive equipment before you even start the research. And bluntly, uh, the absence of an incubator such as I'm going to describe was a main reason why we could not start Tevard, as the company is now known, in Cleveland. We have it in Lab Central in Boston, in Cambridge. And Lab Central was an initiative uh, funded by the Mass Life Sciences Center. It's a not-for-profit. It's a fully equipped research lab. Um, let me try just showing pictures of it, if I may, so that you can see what I'm talking about. Can you see it on the screen? Yes. Great. Okay, so you walk into Lab Central, and what you see is, that, first of all, is an open laboratory that looks like a laboratory in any major university or research hospital, um, but each bench is a company. And you can have one or two workers at the bench, but what makes Lab Central unique is it's stocked with all of the equipment on a shared basis that one would need to do modern biochemistry, molecular biology, and so forth. Uh, all, all manner of microscopes, cold rooms, warm rooms, cell sorters, that sort of thing. It's on a shared basis. There are conference rooms. And uh, it's all on a rental basis. You pay a fixed sum every month. You get all these facilities. Uh, Lab Central handles the administrative things like, lab, like ordering and um, laboratory cleanup and so forth. So you can start a company on Friday. Uh, once you persuade the leaders of Lab Central, again, it's a not-for-profit, that you both have the financial resources and the science to justify a bench there. It's very competitive. You can start work immediately. So three of my startup companies are there. Um, it's only a about four years old, but already 25, 30 companies have graduated Lab Central. Many of them, like Rubius, one of my early companies, uh, are public. And it's not only caused the biotech world to flourish in Cambridge, uh, developing drugs for unmet medical needs, but as uh, equally important, it's created a lot of very good jobs at all levels. So again, it's the kind of example I could see Cleveland doing. Uh, they also have private labs uh, where you can have about 10 researchers. So if the company gets a little bigger, uh, you can move into one of those. And then when uh, you get more people, you simply leave Lab Central and the space is open for a new company. It's been great. I think that's a critical feature is that uh, you can't stay long, right? You're sort of, there's an it's up and two, out kind of approach. It's a two year out or die. Got it. And uh, the idea is uh, if you're really worth what you think you are, you're going to expand, you'll get a series A funding of 20 or $30 million and you're really off developing therapeutics. Exactly. And this is, again, the kind of facility I would love to see in Cleveland. Terrific. Now, at earlier points in the ecosystem, obviously, we need the discoveries uh, churning out of the academic labs at a rapid pace. Dr. Kirsch, so that ecosystem, Dr. Lotus describes, depends on the academic innovation. What is biomedical engineering doing to in biotech? How are you uniquely trained and so successful at developing products and new technologies out of biomedical engineering? You know, biomedical engineering uh, students are trained in the same kind of fundamentals as all the other engineering disciplines, including engineering design. So they know how to come up with solutions to, to challenging problems. The extra advantage that biomedical engineers have though is that these, these fundamentals and the engineering design are learned in a context of 
biology and physiology and the design in particular in the context of medical challenges. So they're aware of some of the issues in bringing uh, ideas to the, to the market. They understand clinical needs, safety, regulatory issues, cl how to, what clinical trials do and reimbursement, the, the whole range of, of, of these considerations. So we like to say that biomedical engineers speak the language of engineering and medicine and are pretty effective at bridging that gap. Here at, at CASE, we have some extra advantages. Our department is actually in both the engineering school and in the medical school. We're a joint department and we have faculty in both and we interact highly with them. We're completely surrounded by top-notch uh, medical centers and our faculty work in all of them. Um, and very effectively collaborate on clinical uh, problems. Uh, in particular, we formed an alliance called the BME Alliance with the Cleveland Clinic Biomedical Engineering Department. And together, we have one of the largest cohorts of, of, of BME faculty in the country. We sort of cover the waterfront when it comes to the areas of medical research. And in general, it's a re enormously rich environment for innovation and product development. So I saw that uh, one of our past chairs, Pat Craig, goes on the line. He coined a term years ago uh, that's our, our tagline, and it's engineering better health. It kind of says it all for our, uh, for our department. So Dr. Kirsch, you also run the Case Coulter Translational Research Partnership that I wanted to highlight. How does that engineer better health? So, you know, the Coulter Foundation established a national program about 13, 14 years ago with the entire idea being to facilitate the transformation of lab discoveries into products. I mean, Harvey mentioned this as well. And that's what they do, to, to products that, that improve healthcare. Um, the, pro, the program that we have here at, the, at CASE, the CASE Culture Translational Research Partnership, is one of those programs. And it's really grown into a national benchmark. And we're really highly successful and a leader in already a highly successful national culture program. You know, for example, our follow on funding to spending ratio is 25. So we've spent a certain amount of money and, and mostly venture capital has resulted 25 times that for the companies that we've assisted. And one in three of our projects uh, get licensed and, and attract capital. And this is a very high number for academic research. So. I think that we've been very successful. And there's a few reasons for that. You know, we provide funds, project funds to teams to move them past barriers to turning their ideas into projects or into products. There's two principal investigators. One's an engineer, one's a, a physician, usually a clinician, and they have a team. And both, I think both physicians and engineers are inherently problem solvers and they tend to solve these clinical problems. Um, the funds are not almost, they're almost never research oriented. They, they are to do things like to figure out what your patent status is, competition, regulatory, the things that, that our students now learn in, in, in their design. It's really to, whatever it takes to convince entrepreneurs what needs to be done to invest in the product, in the idea. Um, so we train our faculty members, we give them money, but we also train them. We help them navigate this process, that most of them weren't trained in this, and we're not trying to turn them into CEOs. We're trying to make their discoveries attractive to people who are professional CEOs so that they'll invest. But we try to make them, and we've been pretty successful at, at helping them be more savvy in this area. We provide them mentors that are um, you know, from, from our oversight committee and from other entrepreneurs that help them through. So I, I think this has been a, a, a top-notch program uh, for, for both for our department, but for the greater Cleveland area. Bob, I've seen, I serve, I'm uh, privileged to serve on the Coulter Board, and I see how, you know, it, it, a nationally benchmarked program exists there, and, and CASE is clearly one of the crown jewels. So the engine of acceleration is working really well. What are you feeding it lately, and what do you expect to get out soon that will be exciting? Yeah, we, we, you know, in general, we, we focus primarily on diagnostic approaches and treatments. And so, you know, our goal, our general goal is to make things that where we can adapt rapidly to new challenges like COVID, for example, develop things that are cost effective and accessible globally. 
and are readily adopted by the medical community. You know, we have to, we have to take in, again, take into consideration the needs of the clinical community. You know, in terms of, of specific areas, in diagnostics, we're developing advanced uh, imaging technologies, it includes ultrasound that uh, use contrast agents. So this is work of a gut actor who's on our panel today that, that can really extend the use of ultrasound. We do optical imaging that's very high resolution for some applications. We have a big magnetic resonance imaging group that is developing mechanisms that allow us, to, you know, they're higher resolution, but allow us to look at, at the body using quantitative techniques that provide like material properties and, and et cetera, instead of just anatomical uh, information. We, we use artificial intelligence and machine learning extensively. I mean, the, these Algorithms can look across different kinds of information like images and genetic information and other pieces of information that um, we, can, we can see patterns that happen that, that, that you couldn't notice as a human being. And it just enhances our ability to diagnose things like cancer and neurological conditions. Um, finally, in terms of you know, that's diagnostics for treatments, we focus on medical devices and therapeutics. Um, medical devices, it's things like electrical stimulation. It's the kind of work that I do. Optical stimulation of the nervous system for things like brain disorders, stroke, Parkinson's disease, psychiatry, for paralysis, for pain, for autonomic disorders like hypertension. And therapeutics, we have a big uh, targeted drug delivery program for cancer treatments and for trauma, for example. And again, Artificial intelligence, machine learning is used to personalize the treatment to individuals and make it very precise. Mm -hmm. So these are the sort of the cutting edge uh, technologies that we're pushing towards the market. Thanks, Dr. Karsh. Yeah. Dr. Chan, you're a well-known physician scientist. You have an international stature in the field of cancer treatment. Tell us about these relatively new or recently established fields of immuno-oncology and immunotherapy. And, and why you decided to come to Cleveland to lead this prestigious center at the Cleveland Clinic. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, no, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the opportunity to chat about uh, these topics. Um, it's very fast-moving, and I think that uh, most folks uh, have seen, especially in the last 10 years, um, how manipulation of the immune system has been able to uh, consolidate and extend the control of cancer and other various diseases like autoimmunity um, across the board, all across the world. So I remember, uh, you know, coming from Memorial Sloan Kettering, I remember some of the, you know, um, you know, I treated some, you know, some of the, I shared some of the patients that received some of the very first uh, immunotherapies, anti-CTLA-4, um, back then, um, and uh, it became very evident that there were definitely some very long-term responders, and many of those patients are even alive now, uh, you know, 15, 20 years later, 15, almost 20 years later, which is quite incredible because, um, you know, when I, when I got into started oncology, this would, would have never been possible. As an example, five-year survival of metastatic melanoma went from about 1%, uh, you know, about 10, 10, 12 years ago to uh, over 50% now with a response rate of over, of over 70%, which is uh, you know, we would have never thought we would be in this situation. So um, the field of immunotherapy actually started um, over 100 years ago with William Cooley, who was this gentleman scientist in the 1900s, turn of the century, who injected bacteria into patients with sarcomas and other diseases, the big tumors. And lo and behold, some of them actually went away, right? So, so then in the course of the last century, there have been many fits and starts, and immunotherapy you know, I would say about 20, 30 years ago, or 20, 20, 15, 20 years ago even, um, was seen as sort of the end of careers, right? But what has changed now is sort of this, uh, this, this sort of merging of different fields. And, and this is what I always think to myself is anytime you have the merging of fields and the, the, uh, the spark that comes from intellectual contribution from various different ways of thinking about things, that's when you have breakthroughs. And, and this is what really what happened around uh, year 2000 or so, uh, you know, when, we, when so, some of the agents that were developed, uh, you know, for immunotherapy like the immune checkpoint blockades, anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1, 
uh, really started to show some efficacy in a very safe manner. And, uh, and you know, pertaining to biotech, this is very, very important, right? Both of those uh, agents or pathways started from academia, small biotech firms. In fact, CTLA-4, remember, was, was originally developed in a small biotech, later on bought by Bristol-Myers, okay? And then further developed and, and, and pushed out into many trials. So what you see here is that in terms of immunotherapy, biotech has been definitely an accelerator uh, for, for immunotherapy developments. And you see this even now with uh, a lot of agents, nectar, you know, a variety of other, you know, different vaccines and so, so forth, merging into, in, into uh, larger consortiums, larger companies um, uh, in, in pharma when they're, uh, you know, when there's promise. And case in point that Mark mentioned before about all these COVID vaccines, right? So some of the leading ones, including Moderna, including BioNTech, you know, all these vaccine, RNA vaccine technologies were developed originally for cancer neoantigen immunotherapies, right? And they got repurposed. Uh, and that's why it was able to move so fast. So you, see a, so you see a scenario where in immunotherapies and translational immunology-based treatments, the biotech sector really is a spark for all this. So I moved to Cleveland uh, largely because um, I was living in New York and uh, it's a fun and nice place, but um, uh, I thought that it, in Cleveland, there was a, a potential to build something very special at the Cleveland Clinic in Case Western uh, School of Medicine. Um, and there was a, a um, sort of a, a threshold of exciting things happening here. Um, and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, investment being placed in this. And I, I thought that having been in, in this field for quite a while, there was an opportunity to practice what the lessons that we have learned from the last 10 years in this field, do things much more efficiently, and to do things uh, in a way that can speed up the translation of uh, ideas for immunotherapeutics into the clinic faster. That's very, that's very exciting. Um, let's go on to uh, Dr. Exner. And... Uh, you're a successful academic innovator. What can you tell us about your journey as a professor and as a participant in the culture program? Sure, so I, I'm going to echo a lot of the things that both Bob and Tim have already said. Um, and I, I guess I sort of embody <laughs> the spirit of things. So I've been on faculty here for the past 17 years. My appointment is in the Department of Radiology, which is located both in the School of Medicine at Case and at University Hospitals. Um, and I think really this bridge between basic and clinical sciences that um, the Department of Bodies has enabled our research to thrive. So as Bob said, we work on um, developing new diagnostic and therapeutic agents specifically for ultrasound imaging. And I'm, this is something that I'm very excited about because um, I think it's going to enable new ultrasound applications. Um, this is a very well-established technology, and I think some innovations would really be inspiring. And, and more so, I think it will make personalized medicine um, more accessible worldwide, which is something that I'm hoping to pursue. But we need products first. Um, and so a lot of what we do in the lab now is in the spirit of translation. Um, and, and as you may imagine, this type of work really sits at the interface of several fields. We work with imaging physicists, biologists, biomaterial scientists, engineers. I have all of that in my lab. Um, and what has really fostered this research and this interdisciplinary nature and allowed it to advance has been, I think, this open and very collaborative climate that the case embodies. And, and really the close proximity of all of these disciplines clustered together really on one campus and in university circle. I mean, we can, it's a very unique advantage to be able to walk across the street and talk to my engineering colleagues um, and then hop over to the hospital. And I do that all in, in an hour, now virtually, but before COVID. <laughs> um, and so really, I think this unique feature um, helps the crosstalk between fields, it drives incredible innovation and enables research that spans the entire continuum from, from molecules to mice to medicine. And I found this integration has been crucial to advancing this work to a more mature stage. And so, so with our technologies, you know, finally we're at a point now, um, I think that we can um, start to think about translation and that really requires a different kind of support and guidance. And, and that's something that's been for us embodied by the culture program specifically. And so um, 
the journey there, I've been involved with Coulter for, for more than three years now, and I can confidently say that it's been one of the most impactful experiences that I've had a case. Um, we've been able to, to get funding to not only gather key data and do risk guard technology, really just make it more attractive to, um, to industry partners, potential partners. That's been great. But I think, I think what I found even more transformative is, is this mentorship process. It's very active, it's very hands-on, and it provides a lot of guidance um, to help us navigate this world beyond academic research, which most of us are really unprepared to do, um, and, and really how to communicate our scientific concepts to all the different stakeholders um, of the pipeline beyond just scientists. So, so I think the journey has been enlightening, a nonstop learning experience, and I'm really grateful to have been a part of it. So part of what uh, the implication is, is that, that there has to be a cultural shift uh, to add sort of uh, things to the, to the toolkit of the academic entrepreneur to get them to succeed. So can you, can you t uh, tell us a little more about that and, and what, you know, what is, uh, what, what's, what are the hard things and, and or let's, let's ask another way. Talk to the audience and 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 give share with them your insight as to what are the hurdles they need to overcome. Uh, yeah, sure. So I wholeheartedly agree that there needs to be a culture change. I think that the process of taking an idea from the lab to the clinic is extremely intimidating to most scientists. This isn't something that's part of you know maybe with the exception of BME. I think this is not part of the the typical training um, that we get in graduate school or in postdoctoral um, work. And so while the foundation of everything must remain rooted in rigorous scientific concepts, discovery-driven research, I think there need to be more activities focused on changing the way that we really think about developing your ideas um, and then providing guidance and negotiating these specific strategic steps um, that are required for translation. And I actually, as an academic, think a big part of that has to do with incentives. Um, and shifting the perspectives in the academic world. So, so for example, when you think of the tenure process to, you know, to be able to maybe include entrepreneurial activities as a metric of academic success, which they traditionally are not thought of as such, um, that I think is super important and it could, you know, um, really advance things and encourage people to step out of their comfort zones of the academic bubble and really go beyond that. So um, there's a ton of time and um, effort associated with translation, but you know, probably that kind of work doesn't result in a nature publication. So, so changing the mindset to show the value of that work and acknowledge it would go a long way. Thank you. So Dr. Lodish, I, I understand, so, so getting your feet wet in industry is sort of one way of learning you know, how, how uh, different kinds of values and approaches to translation. I understand that the Massachusetts Life Science Center supports internships for college students in Massachusetts to work in a company. Has that been successful? Oh no, it absolutely has. And let me just take a, a minute to support what Agata just said about mentoring and encouraging academics to become entrepreneurs. MIT has several programs to do this. I'm currently involved with one um, with, among other people, the retired president of MIT, to a formal program to encourage female faculty to take research out of their labs and start companies. And also, MIT has many graduate programs. Many of the departments have programs in entrepreneurship our business school teaches many courses in entrepreneurship that are often taken by our graduate students and our postdoctoral fellows. And I think that's really part of the culture. And I think the more one can do this to at least make faculty aware of these opportunities, I think the more important it is. So I'm really glad to hear what you're telling us. Um, in terms, yeah, in terms of the, um, program for interns is another of the successes of the Mass Life Sciences Center that is, of course, still ongoing. Um, it's a 
summer program for any Massachusetts resident or any student in a Massachusetts college and university to work a summer in a biotech company uh, under 100 people. So we set the limit of 100 so that they can get experience in the whole operation rather than getting pigeonholed into a particular you know, lab or a particular group. They really can see the whole company. Um, it works as I'm told, as, like a dating service. I've never been on a dating service, but um, the students submit their resumes and what they're interested in. The companies look at these resumes. If there's a match, uh, the state pays for the student. And what's important is that few of the students actually come from Harvard and MIT. Many of them come from state colleges and universities, from community colleges. Many of them are life science majors, but many of them are in fields like computer science or economics or human resources, something like that. Great opportunities. And what we realized is that very few students understand what biotechnology is. It's not just the faculty who may not know how to set up a company, but for many students, it's just not a career option that they think about. And it's proven extremely effective. Uh, I'm told somewhere around half the students get offered jobs by the companies and work there after graduation. And it really affects students at all kinds of institutions and levels of their education. Um, again, I'd love to see this put into place in other locations to give our students this kind of opportunity. Dr. Chan, let me, let me come back to you a second, because you, you were active in the ecosystem in New York and saw, you know, the attempts. And, and I used to be at Einstein College of Medicine, so I'm very familiar with the, the, the budding heads that we had in New York to try to come together and do something. Um, I certainly believe the opportunity in Cleveland uh, is, is here to do something. As an outsider coming in, what are the key things you see or don't see in Cleveland that, that we should be thinking about? Um, well, you know, I am still learning about, uh, you know, the interaction of all the different facilities. You know, what Cleveland has right now is actually an incredible constellation now of world-class uh, medical uh, centers, medical school, of course, uh, and the Case Western University and, and the surrounding universities as well, like Cleveland State and so forth. Um, there is a lot of brain power here. Um, what I think, um, you know, and obviously New York didn't do this, you know, I, I think the model really has been Massachusetts, right? But New York, you know, it's a little bit more of a sort of a, of a, of a you know, Wall Street driven type environment. And only recently, um, the, uh, the Alexandria Bio, Biosciences, you know, a park was established there. And I remember when, the, when you know, the, um, the shovels were first going down for that, you know, next to NYU, um, you know, it was a pretty big gamble. Um, you know, real estate is very high. But ultimately, you know, the lesson learned there was that when there are a number of universities uh, and, and hospital centers surrounding and you have a, a good, um, you know, a, a sort of a threshold of, 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 you know, talent in a certain place, that those types of ventures can be successful. And so I think that Cleveland perhaps could benefit something that Dr. Lotus um, here has, has mentioned, which is an incubator. Uh, you know, or a biotech life sciences uh, corridor or park, an investment in, in, in something like this can really sort of help, I think, the city um, um, sort of bridge that threshold to become an area where it is a destination for, for more biotech than is already here. There's, there's a good amount here already. You know, there's there a, a number of excellent companies, you know, uh, uh, and, and so forth here. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential. Um, the second is um, the you know, when you build infrastructure like this to make it friendly uh, for capital investment, right? So, uh, so, you want, so you want to be able to attract, uh, you know, with the facilities and the brain power here. And so part of that means uh, making a greater presence uh, of some of, you know, uh, the talent and, you know, and, and in, from the innovation offices and the various institutions to really promote uh, what's been developed here at things like J.P. Morgan, you know, every year that happens 
uh, and, and, and to really sort of, you know, really sort of, um, you know, become much more um, aggressive in terms of marketing uh, the, the biotech here um, in, in coordination as a region, right, together at some of the major forums in New York and, and other financial centers. Thank you. Mark? Thank you. Yes, Harvey. Can I just extend what Tim said? Um, one of the reasons Boston and Cambridge work so well is that all the universities, all the medical schools, all the research hospitals, which in general compete with each other, are all on the same page. And the political leadership, as I stress, from the governor down to the city officials in Boston, Cambridge, and then the suburban communities, they all understand it and they all support it. And that becomes very important in really developing the whole area as an ecosystem. And getting all the players together, including the political officials, the mayors, the governors, and getting everyone on the same page is important. You know, I mentioned the internship program. Uh, they used to have a poster session, and the governor hosted it in the state house. And that was also a statement that, you know, this is really important stuff, guys. And people in the legislature who were asked to fund some of this year by year would walk by and talk to these students. I thought that was a brilliant gesture of the government. That's very interesting. Dr. Karsh, I'd like to bring you into the conversation and, and set the context this way. You know, you and I have been great partners in putting together translational optimization, you know, technology optimization, right? We're, we're dipping our toe in more entrepreneurship related programs. We've, 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 we have adopted with or, or stolen with attribution from MIT wherever possible starting a venture mentoring service, and now a translational fellows program. So it sounds like bottom up, we're organizing things. Do you, do you endorse what they're, the message they're sending to our political leaders? We need, we need incubators, we need a biotech park, or are there other missing pieces of capital or other, you know, money or other solutions that, that, that you, you think are necessary? And, and you should know, because you are in a network of culture schools around the country, which is facing this challenge. Yeah, I completely endorse the idea uh, that, that, that Harvey and, and, and Tim and Agata have talked about. Our, you know, our program, our culture program, I would think it would be considered pretty early stage development. And we're later than some of the other uh, programs that we have at the university. And what, what I see, there's a, there's, a, there's a question, maybe it's too early to go to the chat, but that, that, that focuses on this as well. We have to then get over the hump. I mean, it, I guess you could call it the valley of death, but we have these areas or these projects that are ready to go and we need investors and we need uh, qualified uh, executives to run companies. Like I said before, we're, we're, not, we're not trying to t turn ag the agatas of the world into a CEO. You could be one. I'm sure you would be successful, but... Um, <laughs> You know, that's not what we're trying to do. We're, we're the engines, like, like Mark said earlier. We're really the idea drivers. And we, we need that next stage. You know, there is, there is a, 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 a biotech corridor developing in Cleveland. And, you know, we're, we're, we're part of that. Um, we work together very well across our um, different institutions as well. You know, you brought that up in, 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 uh, in Massachusetts, Harvey. It, you know, we work very closely with the Cleveland Clinic Innovations. We work with university hospitals, obviously the case between the School of Engineering and the School of Medicine. And, you know, we have oversight committee members from all around the country. And, you know, we take their advice on, on our projects. But our mission is pretty, uh, you know, it's capped at a certain level of development. And it's really those next steps that need to be taken. So I, I completely endorse the, the Harvey's uh, uh, I, suggestions there. So, if I can just chime in here, I just. I was going to give you the last word. Please do. 
sorry, but I, you saw me shaking my head because I think what's really necessary, I, I cannot be a CEO, right? I do not have the bandwidth. I love the idea of, of having a startup and spinning up technologies, but I, you know, my bandwidth is already felt. And so to have the human capital and have the programs such as what Mark referred to the Translational Fellows Program, which we're really fortunate now to be a part of as well, um, you know, I think is going to really facilitate things um, for people in, in, in my position. Okay. All right. So I think we're ready to go to the questions, especially because uh, I think some of the questioners are, uh, have, have thought carefully. I'm, I'm going to package two questions together in one, and it's coming your way, Harvey. Get, get ready. Okay. So the first is about the co-location. There are two parts to the question. One is the co-location of different companies in Lab Central. Are there concerns about protecting intellectual property and data and things like that? And the second part of the question is, okay, got it. You have this beautiful incubator space for startups near the university, you're spinning them out, but how do we counteract the strong pull of these companies to go away very quickly? And then do we become barely a farm team you know, for the, for the, and I'm paraphrasing the questioner's question, my apologies. Uh, how do we prevent from just these startups uh, 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 slipping away from us? Sure, uh, let, me, let me do them in order. Uh, the question of intellectual property is not really a question. Uh, once you have a patent, uh, your, your intellectual property is protected. Uh, what we find is that working in a startup company can be very lonely if there's only two or three or four of you. But having co-working space where you have uh, your contemporaries, most of the people there are young, unsurprisingly. Uh, you have people to talk to, you share ideas, and increasingly even the large companies are realizing they have to be much more open with what they're doing. You don't want to give away the high level confidential information, the exact composition of the DNA or the molecule. But talking to people from other companies uh, is very profitable in terms of coming up with new ideas. Many of the companies work together and it's really co-working space. That's the advantage. And it's worked out very successfully. Don't forget also the biotech the biotech ecosystem is a very mobile one. People often move from company to company. And in fact, one of the advantages of Massachusetts is there's a large group of people at all levels that may stay with your company for two or three years and then move at a higher level to another company and so forth. So there's a lot of advantages in having uh, this kind of environment where people talk to each other. Um, as far as the second question, uh, you need more than an incubator. Um, Robert mentioned Alexandria, which is a real estate company that builds lab buildings. And they're also a remarkable company because the president many years ago realized that by the time a company is 50 people and moves into one of their buildings, uh, that's probably worth investing in. So Alexandria Real Estate Investors, Alexandria Investors is one of the biggest investors in biotech. So what you would want in Cleveland, besides a lab central or equivalent, is rented lab space where companies can move into when they grow a little bit bigger. And right now, there is not much space in Cleveland, which is one of the reasons many of them will leave. But if you had the space, uh, people will come. It could be initially space that the university builds and develops. I don't know. But uh, that is, is certainly part of it. And, you know, eventually, Cleveland could become a magnet for companies in other cities to come to. So I think, I think it, it, it requires, you know, a more developed ecosystem to, to, to both spawn and keep. To keep will be difficult if you get big enough. On the other hand, 
many companies are spread out over multiple cities. And you can keep a group in Cleveland. Um, I have a company that is half in Singapore and half in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It works. Okay. Here's, let's, uh, let's follow on in that vein. One more. Uh, I think that the Boston, here's a question from the audience. I think that the Boston-Cambridge model has been good, but I think the critical mass was there to start. Now, after a few bold researchers went out and showed that there was opportunity and then the state and other programs developed, these are the ingredients needed for the cake to bake. In Cleveland, we are missing the entrepreneur ingredients. How do we attract that ingredient for our recipe? Well, I would say first that I think we are showing critical mass, formation of critical mass is, is very close, if not there. How would you, you know, we're not Kendall Square. Uh, you famously show pictures of the, of, the, of the flattened Kendall Square in 1974. And I love those pictures, but it can be misleading to people sometimes. We're, we're somewhere else, and, and what do you think our trajectory might be? Look, it's not going to happen within five years. You know, Kendall Square took 40 years to develop, and it was an organic development. When the first biotech companies were set up, uh, the Genzymes, the Biogens, the Replogens, uh, Genetics Institutes, no one paid much attention to them. And over time, uh, once it was shown that they could make products, don't forget you're going to need manufacturing facilities. And that's something else you would want to set up in Cleveland. It's not just a research enterprise. Once you get a therapeutic or a device, you'd like to actually make it and make it in large amounts. And there's another opportunity there, you see. So there are many ways of doing it and building it. And I think a lot of it starts, as Agata said, with faculty entrepreneurs. I think one way to go is to do what we did at Children's Hospital. I'm on the board of Boston Children's. And the technology licensing office offered courses for faculty and postdoctoral fellows in entrepreneurship. You know, starting with what is a patent? <laughs> you see, what is venture capital? Uh, what is a cap sheet for a company? The kind of basic things that, as she said, people don't know. I didn't know it 40 years ago. I teach it now. But certainly 40 years ago, I had no way of knowing. Got it. All right, let's go some 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 other questions. Here's a uh, here's a, a question from uh, one of the audience, uh, and we'll we'll you get to volunteer. I haven't decided to assign it. Uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic was devastating to our elderly population and extended care facilities. I, I couldn't visit my mother for for you know months. Many of us have 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 uh, seen how challenging this is for families. What biotech solutions are possible to better protect our most vulnerable elder, uh, uh, elder, elderly folks in the population? Are there any specific national recommendations would you make, that you would make to operationalize these possibilities? So are there, uh, what can you tell us, panel, about you know, this issue and uh, research or vaccination strategies that will help us with the elderly population? Anyone like to take that? Tim? Yeah, um, I'll take a quick stab at this first. Uh, this is something obviously we've been, uh, many people, not just us, have been thinking about uh, very, uh, taking a lot of time to think about this. So the issue is, uh, so why are the elderly more sensitive? Um, and it comes down to a lot of different uh, you know, thoughts, and, and, and it's still a moving field. Um, one of them is general immune health, okay? Over time, it's very well known that our T cells and the diversity of, of responses that we as human beings, as individuals, becomes more and more sharpened and directed towards certain known insults and, and the potential of diversity of responses shrinks, okay, over time. Um, and that's very well known. So even in some of our own papers, for instance, uh, the overall diversity of your T cell receptor repertoire floating around in your body, which is a measure of what you can recognize, starts decreasing. Amongst some of the things that are most 
strongest uh, decreasers of your general immune health are things like CMV and infections. Okay? And what happens over time is that you have these holes in the ability to, to recognize certain viruses. So in, so in older people, it's going to be very, very important to not assume that a single vaccine directed against a single spike protein region, for instance, is going to do the job. In fact, what we know now in some of our own unpublished data is that as you grow older, the less likely you are to develop specific antibodies against the spike protein. Okay, there are holes in your repertoire. And so it's going to be very important to understand the regions of COVID as we age to understand what those holes are. And, it's, and luckily, many, many people have now developed uh, you know, ways to look at different antibodies and where they're recognizing and so forth. And you need to map this out in order to really rigorously define a, 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 um, a, uh, you know, a rational uh, vaccination strategy. This is not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. Okay. And I think that biotech, uh, because there's so many uh, things going out, really requires, what's going to need to happen is some, some harmony and some harmonization of, of a data and some data sharing at the national stage, NIH, for instance, maybe, uh, and so forth, in order for us to come uh, together to answer some of these questions. It's not going to be a single vaccine. I know that for sure. Tim said that very eloquently. I was going to say general, uh, you know, immune system uh, sort of health, and and you 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 covered that. The other the other approach is to develop techniques for developing vaccines that are more rapidly than than. Now this is maybe a world record for COVID, but it's still quite slow, right? So finding new ways to uh, to find the uh, you know to develop vaccines that are based on maybe things that we don't think of now, physical properties. Um, How about vaccines that are specific for different populations? How soon can we contemplate that kind of advance? So I'll, I'll add in there that one example, for instance, is this, all right? So we, we know that as we age, um, the likelihood of developing neutralizing antibodies and uh, T cell receptor uh, activated uh, epitopes against the, against the uh, spike protein falls. So it's gonna, so a broader base vaccine that hits nucleocapsid and some of these other things concomitantly with spike protein is gonna be needed for elderly folks, is, is my opinion. Agata. Obviously the, the jury's still out there, but yeah. Agata, you have yeah. comments to add? Yeah, I was just gonna chime in with something really simple and, and an initiative that had been going on this um, summer, a case, and that's developing a butter mask technology, right? So Steve Benning, as part of the culture program, I think had organized the summer national um, workshop for, for students to, to join in. And that was their goal to develop a butter mask. And so maybe a mask that protects the user and um, the population would be something very simple to aim toward. Thank you. Those are great answers. Thank you. Let's go to another question. Uh, can you address the current system of funding scientific research, where world-class scientists must spend about 20% of your time hustling funding? Why can't we develop a system where the government foundations and wealthy individuals and their charitable trusts can fund labs for five or more years and keep scientists in their lab and not seeking funding? What does the rest of the world do? So who would like to talk about our, our uh, peer review system and our and the, and the US system, anyone wanna? I would just like to say all? that I would like to sign up for this kind of- <laughs> like to Sign up for that funding program. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> I like this model. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll just say that the peer review system that we have in the US is, it has a few flaws, but overall it's pretty good at sorting out the, the wheat from the chaff. It does go slowly. You have to, it's like running for office though. You're right. You have to keep going back to the, to the funding source. Um, other countries, they have different platforms, you know, different ways of doing this, but sometimes they fund one big person who sort of doles it out more uh, to, to the next tier. Um, that has pluses and minuses. I mean, it, it sort of uh, encourages empires and not necessarily the best science. So that, that's, that's kind of my experience. I, I see it from a slightly different perspective. Yes, it is difficult to get a few hundred thousand dollars for an academic research project. But much of the work that's going on in these small startup biotechs 
is a very high quality and it can be done at a level 10 times or more than one can do in an academic lab. That is, if you really have a spectacular idea of how to treat a disease and by a number of approaches, it actually works better in a company environment. You get investor money, which has its issues, but you can put vastly more resources behind it than you could do getting a usual sized federal grant. And I have found that particularly true with a number of companies that do not derive from my own lab, like Tevard, for instance, uh, where we can explore a whole new class of gene therapies based on transfer RNAs um, with substantial resources. And these are resources that are difficult to get because they're so new in an academic lab. Uh, put another way, NIH, uh, in fact, our funding agencies does not do a good job in understanding risk and risk management. Investors know how to do it because they monetize it. This sounds harsh, but it really works. And uh, I've learned from studies of finance that the, there are novel ways of funding biomedical research in companies that really go much deeper than you could possibly do in an academic lab, which is another reason, of course, for expanding biotech. All right, we have reached three o'clock. We have some questions left, I'm sorry, but we are running out of time. I think I can summarize some of the remaining questions by saying thank you for the shameless plug for the Harrington Discovery Institute to show us that there are more investments in town and, and, and critical mass forming and, 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 and developing. Uh, one of the uh, panelists said, what about a biotech investor meeting? Uh, last year at the Cleveland Clinic Innovation Summit, we did exactly that. The culture program bought it, brought in their pitches. They had an investor panel shake their finger at them, it was extremely invigorating. And, and we need to do two more of that. So uh, thanks again to our panel. Thanks for our audience. You stuck out, or you stuck it through to the end with us. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, this will be available for recording and uh, please have a safe rest of your week. Bye bye now. We hope you enjoyed this panel discussion and are leaving better informed about Greater Cleveland's medical community and how we are managing today's healthcare issues. And most importantly, how we are discovering medical breakthroughs, treating patients, and saving lives. Thank you for watching, and keep healthy and safe.